Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And I don't think we've ever started one of these videos with just the Google home screen as we are starting it today, but it just felt right. While I was talking about other lawsuits in the world of popular culture and technology, and in this case, fantasy novels yesterday, a number of you came to me on Twitter and in the comments to that video asking me why I wasn't immediately covering one of the biggest antitrust stories of the year. And that story is, of course, that the Department of Justice is suing, quote unquote, monopolist Google, assuming the premise, but it's the Department of Justice's right to do so, for violating antitrust laws. And this case is very, very significant. Honestly, more significant than the Epic versus Apple saga that we have been talking about in the past, because that has some problems with its legal premises that we've talked about at length in that series, this particular case that the Department of Justice is bringing against Google is one of the reasons why when discussing those Epic cases, I said that Epic probably had a better case against Google and Android, even though that didn't make intuitive sense to a lot of people. And frankly, I'm not sure it makes intuitive sense to me, but because of the precedent established with the Department of Justice's prior cases, most specifically, the case that they brought against Microsoft in the late 90s and early 2000s. And when we look at this case, there are a couple of things that are important to note. I'm going to say certain things from a policy perspective where I'm going to agree with a lot of you that are going to come into my comments and say, this theory of the case that competitors or competition is being harmed by what Google is doing here, specifically with establishing default protocols doesn't make sense necessarily for the way we live our lives, that the entire case that the Justice Department relies on is this notion that people don't ever change defaults on their phones or on their PC browsers, etc. And I will agree with a lot of you that says that's not really the case. And in all honesty, I could change my default browser whenever I like, but I choose Google because I like it or I go elsewhere because I can see that I can change it. That all makes sense to me. But as a lawyer, if you were sitting in my office and I was advising you as a client and you asked me whether this theory of the case is stronger than some of the other ones that we've discussed, I would say yes, because it was entirely built to mirror Microsoft's losses in those cases, specifically at the court of appeals level, which is something that we're going to have to talk about as we look at this case. So I've got a number of sources ready to talk with you all about. This is going to be a long video, as you undoubtedly know, having clicked on this already. But before we dive in, I wanted to give that kind of bifurcated disclosure that what I'm about to talk about is what I see as the precedential power of prior cases, not necessarily what I think makes sense. And as we've talked about before with respect to antitrust, it's very difficult to predict what any given judge, any given court of appeals, and maybe even ultimately what any given composition of the Supreme Court might decide on these things because they are so fact specific. With that as the background, let's talk about the press release that the Department of Justice put out before we dive directly in to the case itself. Today, the Department of Justice, along with 11 state attorneys general, filed a civil antitrust lawsuit to stop Google from unlawfully maintaining monopolies through anti-competitive and exclusionary practices in the search and search advertising markets. Now, that's an important concept here. A lot of people ask me what this had to do with Epic versus Apple. Specifically, Epic's claims that Apple is operating monopoly on their side and that Google is operating monopoly with Google Play on the mobile platform Android OS Uh, phones. And there's a little bit of overlap there, but for the most part, this case is focused like a laser beam on search, search advertising, and what they also call search text advertising as a subset of the search advertising market. So this doesn't actually have a lot to do with the Epic and Apple fight on the video game side. Now, this was brought with the Department of Justice as well as attorney generals from, I believe it's 11 different states. What's interesting about that list of attorney general is that they all appear to be Republican attorneys general. And why that's interesting is because it was only recently, as we covered in this space, that the House Subcommittee on Antitrust, a majority report from the Democrats, put forth that Google was absolutely 100% a monopoly. All these bad things had to happen to them. I've highlighted a few of these terms from just their executive summary in this report. Google has a monopoly in the markets for general online search and search advertising, exactly the premise of the Department of Justice case. Google maintained its monopoly over general search through a series of anti-competitive tactics. Since capturing a monopoly over general search, Google has steadily proliferated 
its search results page with ads and with Google's own content, while also blurring the distinction between paid ads and organic results. Google has maintained its monopoly over general search, has been through a series of these anti-competitive contracts after purchasing the Android operating system in 2005. Google used contractual restrictions and exclusivity provisions to extend Google's search monopoly from desktop to mobile. Through Chrome, Google now owns the world's most popular browser, a critical gateway to the internet. Internal communications reveal that Google exploits information asymmetries and closely tracks real-time data across markets, and each of its services provides Google with a trove of user data, reinforcing its dominance across markets and driving greater monetization through online ads. Now, I'm not asking anybody that's watching this episode or listening to it as a podcast to agree with any of that. I'm only pointing out that the Democrats in the House of Representatives put forth a 450-page report that basically says exactly what the Department of Justice is going to say in this case, and not a single Democrat attorney general that I can find joined on to this case. Now, that means a couple of things. One, it means that Google should be aware that there are likely potentially more lawsuits coming from the Democrat side of this, that they didn't want to join with the Republican-controlled Department of Justice. Maybe they'll join later. Maybe they will bring their own case. Google is going to have to deal with not just on this axis, but also probably on more coming from other attorneys general and maybe even other parties. So that's interesting in and of itself. The other kind of component of this is that it also suggests that those Democrat attorneys general, or maybe even that whole side of the House of Representatives, or the other folks looking at this antitrust question, find this case to be particularly wanting in some fashion. Now, maybe that's because they don't like the theory of the case. That seems unlikely since it matches up entirely with their executive summary in their report. It is more likely that they feel that it doesn't go far enough. And if that is in fact the case, then, well, Google better hunker down because there's going to be even more serious versions of this coming in perhaps the very near future. Now, the quote from Attorney General William Barr. Today, millions of Americans rely on the internet and online platforms for their daily lives. Competition in this industry is vitally important, which is why today's challenge against Google, the gatekeeper of the internet, for violating antitrust laws is a monumental case both for the Department of Justice and for the American people. This lawsuit strikes at the heart of Google's grip over the internet for millions of American consumers advertisers, small businesses, and entrepreneurs beholden to an unlawful monopolist. I I love the political rhetoric here. And certainly it assumes the premise, right? If you're the Department of Justice, you aren't bringing this case because you think it's a loser. You're bringing it because you think it's a winner and or because you think you can extract some nice penalty fees from Google. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, the overall premise of this case, which we're going to dive deep into, is as follows. As alleged in the complaint, Google has entered into a series of exclusionary agreements. Keep track of that word exclusionary because it doesn't necessarily mean what you might think it would mean and it doesn't necessarily mean what the Department of Justice wants you to think it might mean. That collectively lock up the primary avenues through which users access search engines and thus the internet by requiring that Google be set as the preset default general search engine on billions of mobile devices and computers worldwide and in many cases, prohibiting pre-installation of a competitor. Now, a couple of things there. You see that the primary axis of this argument, and we're going to see it a thousand times when we look through the actual complaint, is the notion that Google is acting in the restraint of trade, is acting as a monopolist under the Sherman Antitrust Act by paying folks to put it as the default choice on their phones, on their tablets, on their browsers, and also prohibiting not installation of a competitor, but pre-installation of a competitor, that these various hardware providers or the browsers themselves, they can't have Bing or DuckDuckGo or whatever it might be pre-installed as a search functionality. They can have that be an option on their phones and browsers. And in fact, they do, as we know, if we've interacted with any computer or phone in the last 10 years, but that isn't enough for the Department of Justice. Now that does ring a mirror if you've been following the Epic versus Apple case on this site in this channel, because that's what Epic said, that Google was effectively allowing sideloading, but it didn't matter because default power was too important. Now, we're going to take a look at the Microsoft case as part of this video, because the court in that case effectively decides that default maybe does have that level of importance, primarily because Microsoft didn't fight it, maybe because they thought it wasn't that important, but that because the court decided that in that case, 
That is what the Department of Justice is relying on right now. And again, from a precedential standpoint, I can see why the Department of Justice thinks they have a good case, where on a logistical and practical side, I don't necessarily think that Google is acting outside the bounds of normalcy or in violation of, at bare minimum, the spirit of the Sherman Antitrust Act. But we are going to talk about that, as promised, as part of this conversation. So let's dive in to 64 pages of court complaint. So we see, once again, the attorneys general reference, and we see that this action is brought under Section 2 of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Now, did you enjoy that little stint here in the court complaint? Because we're going to pop out now for an extended sidebar on what Sherman Antitrust and Section 2 particularly means in this context. If you watched the Antitrust Epic, if you've watched now 26 videos in this series, you can probably skip a little bit ahead. I will try to put a chapter to indicate when I've stopped giving this background. But it's important for folks to note how the Sherman Antitrust Act, particularly Section 2, works. So this law says every person who shall monopolize or attempt to monopolize or combine or conspire with any other person or persons to monopolize any part of the trade or commerce among the several states, so it can't be within one state because that's where federal jurisdiction comes from, shall be deemed guilty of a felony. But it's also important to note that that's way, way, way too broad, right? That that has the impact of saying anybody that does anything to keep anybody else down to compete with them on a very fundamental definitional level could run afoul of those laws. So in interpreting them, which have been around for now hundreds of years, the Federal Trade Commission, the Department of Justice, the courts have looked at them from an unreasonable standpoint. Or as the Federal Trade Commission website says here, the antitrust laws prescribe unlawful mergers and business practices in general terms leaving courts to decide which ones are illegal based on the facts of each case. Yet for over 100 years, the antitrust laws have had the same basic objective, to protect the process of competition for the benefit of consumers, making sure there are strong incentives for businesses to operate efficiently, keep prices down, and keep quality up. The Sherman Act outlaws every contract, combination, or conspiracy and restraint of trade and any monopolization, attempted monopolization, or conspiracy or combination to monopolize. Long ago, the Supreme Court decided that the Sherman Act does not prohibit every restraint of trade, only those that are unreasonable. For instance, in some sense, an agreement between two individuals to form a partnership restrains trade, but may not do so unreasonably, and thus may be lawful under the antitrust laws. This includes plain arrangements among competing individuals or businesses to fix prices, divide markets, or rig bids as per se illegal. So there's a category of things that the courts have looked at now over the course of 100 years that say these things are so bad as to be per se illegal. Everything else we're going to evaluate on what different courts will call different things, but for the most part is called the rule of reason. And the rule of reason results in this kind of fact-specific analysis that we're going to figure out whether this illegally restrains trade. And if it does restrain trade or it monopolizes or excludes competitors in some fashion that we don't like, we're going to give the chance to the other side to prove that there is some reasonable pro-competitive justification for that. And we're going to have this kind of battle of ideas on what the reasoning behind these various business policies is. Now, as you can imagine, That leaves companies a little bit in the lurch that some court someday is going to look at your business decisions and decide whether or not they were exclusionary, decide whether or not they were pro-competitive, and maybe they're okay, maybe they're not. The Sherman Antitrust Act and really American jurisprudence, especially in the digital and software fields, doesn't provide the contours that you would need if you were operating a company. And it doesn't really help that the courts have said it's not illegal for a company to have a monopoly or to charge high prices. Right, that's the other component of this that I know a number of you are probably already aware of that gets lost on the internet, on YouTube, even from some legal analysis, that it's not illegal to have a 95% market share. It's not illegal to be a monopolist. It's illegal to maintain that monopoly or to create that monopoly with unreasonable methods, as framed here by the Federal Trade Commission. Or if we look at it a little bit further, the court has to determine whether you have monopoly power in a relevant market. This requires in-depth study of the products sold by the leading firm and any alternative products consumers may turn to if the firm attempted to raise prices. Then courts ask if that leading position was gained or maintained through improper conduct. That is something other than having a better product, superior management, or even historic accident. You were just there first and it got sticky. That's allowed. What isn't allowed is doing these things that the court will determine after you have done them are quote unquote exclusionary. 
which leaves us in the position that we're in right now, which is that the Department of Justice is saying that whatever Google is doing, which we're going to talk about right now, is exclusionary in a way that is unreasonable and that Google is using its market position to harm the actual consumers. Now, there's a couple of consumer groups there. They will make a couple of claims about advertisers, that they aren't getting the bang for the buck that they should from purchasing search advertising space on the Google engine itself, but also consumers in general, which is really where most of these kinds of cases usually lay because you have to show that Hogue or Bob or Mary or Joe is actually being harmed by what one of these companies is doing in order to bring a successful case under the Sherman Act or the Clayton Act or whatever else you're trying to bring as the Department of Justice or in a civil case. So that's the background. The other bit of background that we talked about as part of the press release was that this relates to general search services, search advertising, and general search text advertising, and not other stuff. If we went and we looked at William Barr's press release, which I didn't bring up as part of this video, he points out that this is not a case about some of the other things that you are seeing. It's not about the Communications Decency Act, Section 230. It's not about censorship. It's not about uh, advertising space, favoring Democrats over Republicans, Republicans over Democrats. It's not about those questions. It's about anti-competitive action, primarily through the use of what they call exclusionary contracts to set defaults. Now we get into a little bit of the overview that they give for Google. And we see once again, just like in the Epic case, that the current way of writing one of these is very... um, genteel. It's very journalistic. It looks like it's an article in the New York Times or something along those lines rather than a legal document. These would have been written much more dryly in the past. And in fact, if you go and you look at the Microsoft case, the original complaint that the Department of Justice made in the late 90s, in that case, it was much more dry than this. But here the Department of Justice says as follows. Two decades ago, Google became the darling of Silicon Valley as a scrappy startup with an innovative way to search the emerging internet. That Google is long gone. The Google of today is a monopoly gatekeeper for the internet and one of the wealthiest companies on the planet with a market value of $1 trillion and annual revenues exceeding $160 billion. Now, what's interesting there is this is a Republican AG, uh, a Republican attorney generals from the various states, 11 of them, I believe. And it's weird to have a sentence there that really seems to decry a company that is at some level an American success story, that they were a scrappy underdog not too long ago, really not, and that they are now worth a trillion dollars. And that's used to establish that you should think of them badly, judge. It's an interesting position, especially for a Republican administration to take. For many years, Google has used anti-competitive tactics to maintain and extend its monopolies. As many other businesses, a general search engine must find an effective path to consumers for it to be successful. Now, you'll see that phrase a lot. General search services, general search engine. They have to do the very difficult thing, which Google will argue about, and we'll see at the end of this video, that Google services in search are distinct and different from searching for products on Amazon or searching for airfares on Expedia. That Google search is not something that should just be part of this big market of internet search services, but is in fact this kind of generalized concept. Now, there is a distinction, of course, between your Bings and your Googles and your Amazons and your Expedias. But the question becomes, if you wanted to leave Google for some reason to go find something more specific, could you do it at one of these more specific sites? And I think the answer to that is yes. And the Department of Justice struggles to establish that there aren't good substitutes for using Google if a consumer wanted them. Today, General search engines are distributed primarily on mobile devices, smartphones and tablets, and computers, desktops and laptops. For a general search engine, by far the most effective means of distribution is to be the preset default general search engine for mobile and computer search access points. Even where users can change the default they rarely do, this leaves the preset default general search engine with de facto exclusivity. Now this is the main heart of their case. And it's hard for me to buy on a practical level, separate from the legal precedent, which we will talk about. On a practical level, this is Google saying, we're going to pay Apple, we are going to pay various browsers, Safari, things like that, to make it so that without you hitting any other buttons, Google search is gonna be your first bite of the Apple, so to speak. So when you use that Google search, the consumer has a choice. They can say, hey, I like this product. They can continue on with it, or they can change it in the various mobile hardware pieces or their various computers and browser uh, access points that they have. 
And the Department of Justice has to say that because so many people don't do that, that the default is so strong as to exclude other parties. Now, I do think there's a case to be made that default is important. Of course it is. We talk about these kinds of things on an economics level all the time, that whatever the current kind of thing that you're focused on can help change consumer behavior. But at the end of the day, if the Google product wasn't worth having, if it wasn't something that people at least accepted, if not outright liked, it's an easy enough thing to change that it really strikes me as difficult for somebody to claim that it is fully exclusionary. And that's exactly what Google will argue. And I have no doubt that that's what a lot of you will argue in the comments to this video or elsewhere on my social media, right? Because de facto exclusivity means that it's not de jure exclusivity. It's not contractual exclusivity. It's not legal exclusivity. They're trying to establish that Google has made it very easy to stick with Google, but they haven't actually established that people couldn't change it if they wanted to. And that's going to be a hurdle for their case, even though the Microsoft court found that that kind of default nudging was something that could be in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which we will talk about. We also see references as follows. For years, Google has entered into exclusionary agreements, including tying arrangements, and engaged in anti-competitive conduct to lock up distribution channels and block rivals. Google pays billions of dollars each year to distributors, including popular device manufacturers such as Apple, LG, Motorola, and Samsung, major U.S. wireless carriers such as AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon, and browser developers such as Mozilla, Opera, and UC Web to secure default status for its general search engine, and in many cases to specifically prohibit Google's counterparties from dealing with Google's competitors. Now, prohibit is, again, a little bit strong there. You saw the reference to pre-installation. We will see that it's not really a prohibition necessarily as much as really locking in these default rules, with some exception. There are a couple of cases where the Google Play Store has apparently prohibited other kind of app stores. We saw that in the Epic case, for instance, and we'll see it referenced slightly here. It's not what they are focused on. But one of the things I wanted to note in this paragraph, and I will note it again when they get to this discussion more fulsomely, is that It's an odd thing to make the case that Google is a monopolist with monopoly power that nonetheless has to pay billions of dollars of the revenue it receives out to these various hardware access points in order to make sure that they stay there. That that isn't generally indicative of a monopolist with monopoly power. They would just cut the money and then Apple has to keep them because they have this monopoly power, Motorola or Samsung. And to the extent that Google doesn't believe that that is in fact the case, it suggests a certain weakness of durability of their market presence that generally speaks against a market power kind of calculation. And I think the Department of Justice just ignores that here and says, well, it, since Google is paying all this money, it's, it's spending all this money to lock up this space. But that suggests a certain weakness of their position that really just gets elided in this entire case and, and might be something that Google can use in the future. Google's exclusionary agreements cover just under 60% of all general search queries. Nearly half the remaining queries are funneled through Google-owned and operated properties, including Google's browser Chrome, so they actually think it's a higher percentage. Largely as a result of Google's exclusionary agreements and anti-competitive conduct, Google in recent years has accounted for nearly 90% of all general search engine queries in the United States and almost 95% of queries on mobile devices. Now, that very first proviso, largely as a result of Google's exclusionary agreements and anti-competitive conduct, is necessary for the Department of Justice's case. But I think you could probably already see the main problem they have with their theory is that they are basing it on this default presence, which is going to look identical to exclusionary agreements and anti-competitive conduct to we've got the best product on the market, right? If we've got the best product on the market, then people aren't going to leave when they see us as the default. I don't know about you. I still use Google primarily for the defaults on things like my phone, and I've tried other browsers, and I tend to like the way they present their information and what they deliver more than other browsers. Some of you might disagree. That is your right. I would bet that you changed your default browser on whatever access point that you have if you do disagree. And that's exactly what a competitive marketplace looks like. It's just that 90 to 95% of people are okay with Google. Now, there could be exclusionary agreements and anti-competitive conduct that leads to that, but the theory of this case has that fundamental problem, which is it's impossible to bifurcate what having the best product in the market would look like versus complaining about these exclusionary agreements. That's why they brought up the billions of dollars, because their argument goes they wouldn't need to spend it if they were just winning the hearts and minds of the people. It's a decent argument, but it has the weaknesses that I presented already. Google has thus foreclosed competition for internet search. 
to which I would say objection facts, not evidence, right? We're talking about defaults, not foreclosure of competition. And foreclosure is an important word in antitrust law because you actually have to go and do something that is exclusionary. You have to foreclose. You have to halt the ability for a competitor to compete. And if you aren't doing that, especially if you're just talking about defaults, then I say, hmm, you've got a certain weakness in your case. And again, it's one that they're going to try to backstop with Microsoft versus the United States. Google monetizes this search monopoly in the markets for search advertising and general search text advertising. Google uses consumer search queries and consumer information to sell advertising. In the United States, advertisers pay about $40 billion annually to place ads on Google's search engine results page. Now, for in the interest of full disclosure, Hoag Law is a customer of Google ads. We purchase ads on the Google search pages in order to tell people that we exist and we are servicing entrepreneurs and small businesses throughout the country, but especially here in Michigan. So we do pay Google money for that. Now we are a infinitesimally small portion of $40 billion received from Google on an annual basis, but we do have that relationship. And it is because I think it's a very good place to advertise my services. These enormous payments create a strong disincentive for distributors to switch because Google shares a portion of this money with those distribution access points. Google's anti-competitive practices are especially pernicious, great word, because they deny rivals scale to compete effectively. When asked to name Google's biggest strength in search, Google's former CEO explained, scale is the key. We just have so much scale in terms of the data we can bring to bear. Now understand what the Department of Justice is saying here. Google's collecting all that data. It's preventing others from collecting that data. And that's a bad thing. It's a weird argument to make, especially with a lot of the privacy concerns that people have in technology just in general today. And it says Google has all this data and it's preventing other people from getting that data. And that's a bad thing. But overall, at the same time, the legislature and various regulatory bodies in various countries and jurisdictions are moving to prevent all of these companies from accessing that data. That might have been a better way to try to get at Google and some of these scale differences that the Department of Justice is pointing out right now. Google's grip over distribution also thwarts potential innovation. DuckDuckGo, for instance, differentiates itself from Google through its privacy protective policies. But Google's control of search access points means that these new search models are denied the tools to become true rivals. Effective paths to market and access at scale to consumers, advertisers, or data. Yep, they're a big company. And in order to fight them, you're going to have to get big and get big fast. That's true. That's not different in any other industry in the United States or really elsewhere around the globe. Now we get to section 10, and this is where we're going to have another sidebar where we talk at length about this case, United States versus Microsoft. Google's practices are anti-competitive under long established antitrust law. Almost 20 years ago, the DC circuit recognized that anti-competitive agreements by a high-tech monopolist shutting off effective distribution channels for rivals, such as by requiring preset default status and making software undeletable, were exclusionary and unlawful under Section 2 of the Sherman Act. Now, a couple of things here. That is somewhat long established antitrust law, but it hasn't been revisited in any great scope. If you actually go and look at the press releases on this case, you will see that this is the Department of Justice crowing about the fact that this is the first time that they've really looked at issues like this since this case in United States versus Microsoft. It's also worth noting that United States versus Microsoft had a somewhat tortured history, right? So I've brought up a couple of things. I want to talk about the baselines that Microsoft established that mirrored some other antitrust rulings in other industries. I also want to talk about where this case came out, especially how the Court of Appeals looked at this case, because that's more important than what the U.S. District Court says, despite the fact that the D.C. Circuit is all that's talked about as part of the Department of Justice's claim here. So if we go and we look, we see what the basic rules are here. First, as we talked about, the court must first ascertain the boundaries of the commercial activity that can be termed the relevant market. Microsoft's share of the worldwide market for Intel-compatible PC operating systems currently exceeds 95%. So they find a problematic market. Now, as we've talked about, just being a monopoly power doesn't actually get you in trouble with the law. So now they have to establish, as the court does here in Microsoft versus the United States, what it means to be unlawfully using monopoly power in this context. In a Section 2 case, a Section 2 Sherman Antitrust case, once it is proved that the defendant possesses monopoly power in a relevant market, 
Liability for monopolization depends on a showing that the defendant used anti-competitive methods to achieve or maintain its position. The threshold question in this analysis is whether the defendant's conduct is exclusionary. That is, whether it has restricted significantly or threatens to restrict significantly the ability of other firms to compete in the relevant market on the merits of what they offer customers. If the evidence reveals a significant exclusionary impact in the relevant market, the defendant's conduct will be labeled anti-competitive and liability will attach unless the defendant comes forward with specific pro-competitive business motivations that explain the full extent of its exclusionary conduct. So as we talked about, this kind of rule of reason analysis is a bit of a ping pong match or a tennis match, if you prefer, where effectively they have to say, okay, this thing that you are doing is exclusionary. It's excluding potential competition from the space, from the relevant market. And so you are a bad person. Then the party that's actually engaged in that action can come back to the court and say, no, that might be happening. It might be excluding competitors, but we are doing it for this quote unquote pro-competitive business reason right? Because if we really take it down to its brass tacks, if we really look at the Sherman Antitrust Act, everything that we see as exclusionary or anti-competitive is really just very, very, very aggressive competition, right? And that's always been a problem with interpretation of this law by the courts and really across the globe as they interpret their antitrust laws, because what could be more aggressive than trying to cripple your competition? That is maximum competitiveness. But at some level, the courts have to establish that you go too far, And that by excluding people from participating, from acting against you, that that crosses this line into quote unquote anti-competitive behavior. And then it's on you to establish that, yes, it looks like it crosses that line, but it's really for this good reason that helps primarily consumers. And if you can make that case, then the plaintiff has to come back and say, well, all right, you've got a pro-competitive reason, but it's still worse. It's still too exclusionary for even that pro-competitive reason. And so you should still get in trouble. At the end of the day, this court found that Microsoft's practices were in total violation of the Sherman Act. And they said that Microsoft had a problem because they weren't apologetic about it. Microsoft does not yet concede that any of its business practices violated the Sherman Act. Microsoft, convinced of its innocence, continues to do business as it has in the past. And Microsoft has proved untrustworthy. And so what did this court actually order on June 7th, 2000? Nothing short of a complete breakup of Microsoft. And were that the end of the story, that would be pretty good precedent for the Department of Justice in this particular case. But it was not. As this got appealed up to the Court of Appeals, the court found that some of what the lower court had in terms of findings of law and findings of fact was accurate, but some of it was not. They say, we affirm in part and reverse in part the district court's judgment that Microsoft violated Section 2 of the Sherman Act by employing anti-competitive means to maintain a monopoly in the operating system market. We reverse the district court's determination that Microsoft violated Section 2 of the Sherman Act by illegally attempting to monopolize the internet browser market. That's the actual app that goes with the operating system. And we remand the district court's finding that Microsoft violated Section 1 of the Sherman Act by unlawfully tying its browser to its operating system. And we'll take a look at that tying consideration as part of this video as well. But they have a problem, this Court of Appeals does, with establishing that increased functionality, mandating that more free software as part of your operating system goes to consumers is somehow per se illegal and that a rule of reason analysis is justified in those cases. And the Department of Justice doesn't necessarily fight that in their claim as of yesterday, but it's still worth noting that the Microsoft case is not nearly as clean as people present it as, not the least of which is for the reason highlighted in green. Finally, we vacate the final judgment on remedies because the trial judge engaged in impermissible ex parte contacts by holding secret interviews with members of the media and made numerous offensive comments about Microsoft officials. So the Court of Appeals actually sits here and says, yes, we're going to accept certain of these findings of facts and findings of law, but we will note that the judge was clearly biased against Microsoft at the lower level, and so much so that we are going to vacate the entirety of the final judgment and remand certain of these issues. Ultimately, this would lead to a settlement in the case between Microsoft and the United States Department of Justice and Netscape Navigator gaining market share Maybe because of this, maybe not. Economists all over the place disagree as to whether this was effective or not. But at the end of the day, the Microsoft case didn't really lead fully to a precedential impact that the Department of Justice is trying to claim in this case. Now, when we get to talking about their contracts, specifically what they call exclusionary, we're going to look 
at what the Court of Appeals in the Microsoft case actually did accept as arguments that Microsoft was violating Section 2 of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is clearly what the Department of Justice is basing this claim on. But we will also see that just like every other antitrust inquiry, it is based very specifically on the facts and circumstances of what is happening at the Microsoft level in that case and in the Google level in this case, and that Microsoft didn't defend itself properly for what the court was looking for in respect of that pro-competitive business justification in a way that it would surprise me if Google would not be doing in this very similar case. But that's why the Department of Justice references United States versus Microsoft, and that's why maybe it's not as clean as the DOJ makes it look. They do note that Google did learn one thing from Microsoft to choose its word carefully to avoid antitrust scrutiny. Referring to a notorious line from the Microsoft case, Google's chief economist wrote, we should be careful about what we say in both public and private, cutting off the air supply and similar phrases should be avoided. In particular, Google employees were instructed to avoid using terms such as bundle, tie, crush, kill, hurt, or block competition. Now, there isn't actually anything illegal about telling your employees to not use such words because, of course, as a corporation, we would never deign to do such things were they to be found illegal and violations of the Antitrust Act. And so we're just informing our employees not even to think along those lines. But the Department of Justice coyly says, yeah, of course, you're telling them not to say that because you know it gets you in trouble with us. And to be honest, they're probably right. Google has refused to diverge from its anti-competitive path. Earlier this year, while the United States was investigating Google's anti-competitive conduct, Google entered into agreements with distributors that are even more exclusionary than the agreements they replaced. Of course, there wasn't a case against them, so you don't have to change your behavior just because you're being investigated. A lot of companies are investigated a lot of the time. Absent a court order, Google will continue executing its anti-competitive strategy, crippling the competitive process, reducing consumer choice, and stifling innovation. Again, these are all things that the DOJ has to show because the courts have interpreted the Sherman Antitrust Act to really be about protecting those consumers. So you have to show that Google doing this hurts innovation, hurts consumer choice, hurts consumers in some real tangible fashion, because otherwise the jurisprudence of the United States is, why should the Department of Justice be getting involved? Because Google's doing its thing, and if consumers aren't hurt by it, then we should be very cautious about using the tools of government to affect just change for the sake of change. Now, we've got a lot of background here about how search engines work, how computers work, that I'm going to skip. These are useful. You can check out the case, of course, in the description to this video. These are useful, especially to judges and people that might not have the technological background of some others. But for the most part, this stays pretty superficial. This is how you type things into Google and how Google works in general. Given the internet's enormous breadth and constant evolution, establishing and maintaining a commercially viable general search engine is an expensive process. So they're trying to establish barriers to entry. That's one of the parts of defining a good market. that You can't find substitutes and competitors really have to get capital together to fight with you. So exclusionary acts are more problematic in a market such as that because it takes so much time and money and effort to even get started. The United States has only three general search engines that crawl the internet. Google, Bing, and to a lesser extent, privacy-focused search provider DuckDuckGo. A fourth general search engine, Yahoo, does not currently crawl the internet and instead purchases search results from Bing. This was a fact I did not know. So thank you, Department of Justice. I didn't know that Yahoo didn't actually have a search engine that was functional. It actually just purchases its results from Microsoft, perhaps because I don't use Yahoo as a search engine because I never liked the mass of content on their various screens when I did like this nice and naked Google page. In any event, For example, consumers can search retail marketplaces such as Amazon or eBay to shop for products or go to Expedia or Priceline to compare airfares. Search sites that offer users a narrower, focused set of answers to queries are specialized search engines. Most general search engines do not charge a cash price to consumers. At least one, Bing, even offers to pay consumers rewards for using its general search engine. That does not mean, however, that these general search engines are free. Now... It doesn't. There's no such thing as a free lunch. You had to spend your time. Maybe you had to spend your gas to get there. As we see the Department of Justice say here, you have to give your personal information and quote unquote attention in exchange for the search results, which gives them eyeball space to give ads. Those aren't generally things we would think of as non-free in the normal way that we live our lives. Because yeah, we have to give our data. We have to do these various things. Presumably a lot of these people that use these search engines are aware of that and are doing it freely. 
But the Department of Justice is trying to establish here that there is a cost to consumers of the way that Google does business. And if you don't have a Google that is competing with other search engines, then you don't necessarily have a reason to go and find someone else that is doing maybe less with the data that they're collecting in a way that you like better. It's not a bad argument necessarily, but it does align certain ways that we usually think about anti-competition, antitrust laws in general. They then give a little bit of description about how Google Ads works. And then eventually Google discovered that it could increase the number of clicks and its own profits by ranking ads to promote those with greater relevance and therefore higher expected click-through rates. Now here, I thought they were gonna go into some biases, that they weren't following their terms of service, that they were advantaging certain ads over others. They don't really. This is all just kind of blanket trying to establish that Google's not your friend, which no corporation is. If you take nothing else away from virtual legality, take that. You can have good products and services from a given corporation, but the next one might not be what you want. And in no fashion are they after your best interests in general. They're just after market share and pleasing the most amount of consumers, yes, for the longest period of time, but that might not include you. We also see references to how advertising works, which is nice. You know, they put this funnel here. This is how you get clients. This is how you get customers to buy your shoes, whatever it might be. They show how ads work on Google. They show, in fact, an ad for shoes, what text ads look like, how organic results don't really differ from ads very much. And again, this is one of those things I pointed out earlier this year where I said, yeah, that isn't very distinct. This is the kind of thing that runs afoul potentially of false advertising complaints that you aren't really establishing that your ad is very different. They used to have kind of a blue box uh, that went with ads to really distinguish them from organic results. And they dropped that a little bit. And I think that could be something that could be subject to a federal trade commission claim about false advertising and not showing what's an advertisement versus what is not, but not necessarily something that is anti-competitive. We see importance of scale. It's important that they get a lot of data. And then we see mobile search distribution channels. They say with roughly 60% of searches, mobile devices represent the largest and over the last five years, fastest growing search distribution channel. In fact, if you go and you look at Hogue Law hits on our website or even on this YouTube channel, you'll see a lot of them. The majority of them come from phones or phones and tablets. Fewer people are looking for those kinds of things directly on their computer. So that's entirely true, but it doesn't necessarily solve their case for them. For mobile browsers, Google is the default search provider for both Apple Safari, approximately 55% share, and Google Chrome, over 35% share, which together accounts for over 90% of the browser usage on mobile devices in the United States. But again, default search provider, not exclusive search provider. Consumers typically do not change their mobile devices default search functions, which is fine. And maybe something that if you were the Department of Justice or any other aspect of the executive branch of the United States government, you would say is worthwhile of an advertising campaign. Hey folks, you can change your default search browser. And maybe Bing could do that. Or maybe DuckDuckGo could do that. They could spend that money on something like that. But ultimately this entire case rests on the fact that consumers don't change their mobile devices default and is that because they're lazy? Is it because they don't know that they can? Or is it because they're just happy with that default? It's very difficult to kind of break those apart in a fashion that winds up with Google being exclusively a bad actor. Consumers may not understand that they can change the browser's preset default general search engine, or consumers may not bother to invest the time to make such a switch. Of course, understood in this invisible ink right here is, or consumers might just be happy with Google. And that's, of course, what Google is going to argue. In the United States, roughly 60% of all search queries are covered by Google's exclusionary agreements. There's that term again. On mobile devices, Google's exclusionary agreements cover more than 80% of all U.S. search queries. Google's distribution agreements come in three basic types. Now, we're going to try to skip a lot of this. It's worth pointing out here that this particular complaint does something that I really hate when I look at lawsuit complaints, and that is that it repeats itself, I think, three or four times. So I'm going to try not to bore you with the repetition that the Department of Justice bored me with, but we're going to get a little bit of that because they've done it as both the summary level that we've already talked about. They're going to do it as this kind of mid-summary level. Then they're going to do it in a detailed level, and then they're going to repeat it one final time as part of their actual legal complaints. So we're going to try to not talk about these things over and over again, and I'm going to do my best. I apologize in advance if we wind up covering some of the same ground multiple times. You can blame the Department of Justice. First, Google requires Android device manufacturers that want to pre-install Google's proprietary apps to sign an anti-forking agreement, which is not a term I had heard before, but it's fun. 
These agreements set strict limits on the manufacturer's ability to sell Android devices that do not comply with Google's technical and design standards. So anti-forking is, okay, you're buying our operating system, Android. You are a hardware manufacturer. You're going to have to meet certain of our technical restrictions, certain of the technical requirements that we have for somebody that we sell our operating system to. Now, of course, if you aren't looking at this from an antitrust lens, you could say, yeah, Google has a vested interest in making sure that the hardware that you are choosing to sell doesn't just break while operating Android because that Android trademark, that Android goodwill is focused on Google and they want to make sure that it runs in some kind of fashion that makes sense on your hardware. And certain folks might try to cut corners in a way that makes Google and Android look bad. And that's a pro-competitive business justification for having these kinds of restrictions. Of course, the Department of Justice doesn't bring that up. Google probably will in their response. But it's worth noting whenever you read a document like this that, of course, it's fine. They skip all of the arguments that could be used against them on these particular kind of topics. Google provides access to its vital proprietary apps and application program interfaces, those APIs that we've talked about before, for pre-installation, but only if the manufacturers contractually agree to take a bundle of other Google apps, such as Google Play, make certain apps undeletable, and give Google the most valuable and important real estate on the default home screen. Know what you don't see here. You don't see a reference to not being allowed to put on something separately. That actually comes up with Google Play. I'm surprised it wasn't brought up here, kind of separate app stores and things along those lines. But sideloading, unlike Epic, who just goes straight as a bull through a China uh, store and doesn't care, China shop. And what you've got here is the Department of Justice saying, we're not going to claim that Google prohibits other app stores or other apps on their system. We're just going to base our claim on the fact that default is so much more important uh, than something else. And I do think that does present a weakness, as I've said before. Finally, Google provides a share of its search advertising revenue to Android device manufacturers, mobile phone carriers, competing browsers, and Apple. In exchange, Google becomes the preset default general search engine for the most important search access points on a computer or mobile device. These agreements work exactly as Google designed them to foreclose distribution to Google's search rivals. Again, foreclose is a bit of a strong word here. Weakening them as competitive alternatives for consumers and advertisers by denying them scale. Yes, I suppose they have foreclosed their access to the default standpoint, but not access to the actual consumer base. So it does present a problem. To help the Android ecosystem achieve critical mass and to advance the network effects, Google shared its search advertising and app store revenues with distributors as further inducement to give up control and also indicative, as we've talked about before, of the fact that they weren't monopoly providers of Android, certainly at the start. Today, Android represents over 95% of licensable mobile operating systems for smartphones and tablets in the United States and accounts for over 70% of all mobile device usage worldwide. The only other mobile operating system with significant market share in the United States is Apple iOS, which is not licensable. Now, that's worth noting. Epic calls it a duopoly, but Apple iOS is not licensable. It allows the Department of Justice to make this claim on only licensable (laughs) mobile operating systems for this purpose, when if they had to take a bigger swath of operating systems, this number would, of course, come down. Now you get a big picture of what they're talking about with respect to these quote-unquote exclusionary Android agreements. You have that anti-forking, the hardware limitations, the pre-installation agreements, and then the revenue sharing agreements. Now the revenue sharing is just them buying these other agreements. It's how they give money for them entering into the anti-forking and the pre-installation agreements. It's not specifically otherwise exclusionary. The Department of Justice has to struggle to make that case as part of this document as well, but they present a competent case of how they see this playing out, why it's exclusionary, The fundamental problem is, of course, that it's only about default and not actual exclusion. These agreements broadly prohibit manufacturers from taking any actions that may cause or result in the fragmentation of Android. Notably, as we've talked about a thousand times in virtual legality, fragmentation is left undefined, giving Google wide latitude in practice. Congratulations, Department of Justice. You and I are in rapt agreement on this particular point. It is worth noting when people put ambiguous terms in the terms of service because they can use them for any reason that they want, as we have talked about with respect to Twitch and with respect to YouTube, obviously a Google company, and all these various terms of service that allow this kind of without definition prohibition does result in this quote unquote wide latitude. And it is always and forever worth noting. Now we continue on. They repeat themselves a lot. An app store is one of the most valuable features of a mobile device because it offers access to compatible apps that do not come pre-installed on the device. 
For years, Google Play has been the only commercially significant app store option for Android manufacturers, and it can only be put on the Android OS if you sign up to one of these Google mobile services agreements. That's the point of the Department of Justice here. Signing a pre-installation agreement is the only way for an Android device to pre-install any Google app, including Google Play. And since they are so important, this is where I think the Department of Justice probably has some of their best points. This is why I thought Epic's claim against Android and Google was strong is because it does mirror some of what we saw with respect to Microsoft and the United States, which we will talk about in just a second. Google enters into search revenue sharing agreements with Android manufacturers and carriers. Under this version of the revenue sharing agreements, the distributor receives a payment from Google only if all the distributor's Android devices comply with the exclusivity requirements. So they control these other agreements through the use of the revenue share. Now you have to assume that those are exclusivity requirements. You have to ex- assume that they are exclusionary agreements as, as the Department of Justice does here. But at the end of the day, it is undoubtedly the case that Google is incentivizing compliance with those documents with a big pot of money. On the mobile side, Google pays manufacturers to forego pre-installing rival general search services on their Android devices and comply with a significant number of incentive implementation requirements. To maximize payments under the MIAs, those agreements, the manufacturers must also set Google as the default for all search access points on nearly all of their devices. So to get that money, to get those pre-installations, to work with Google and Android on this basis, they have to set these search access points to default to Google search. It's part and parcel to these agreements. Revenue sharing agreements, Apple and others. Google has entered into revenue sharing agreements with rival browsers and other device manufacturers. Most significantly, Google has had a series of search distribution agreements with Apple, effectively locking up one of the most significant distribution channels for general search engines. In 2005, Apple began using Google as the preset default general search engine for Apple's Safari browser. In return, Google gave Apple a significant percentage of Google's advertising revenue derived from the search queries on Apple devices, right? So when we talk about this, we're talking about setting defaults. We're talking about exclusionary contracts, especially for this purpose, because it matches with what we saw in United States versus Microsoft with respect to Apple, which is ostensibly a Google competitor, right? Google is selling Android OS. Apple is doing its own thing with its own OS and its own hardware. They are competitors of a sort at the hardware level, at the operating system level. And so we can see that this perhaps is a stronger argument than others that the Department of Justice makes. So let's take a look at what the DC court or the Circuit Court of Appeals said about Microsoft and its exclusionary agreements back during the Microsoft case. The district court also condemned as exclusionary Microsoft's agreement with various IAPs. Now, that's not in-app purchases. Those are internet access providers like America Online and things that made more sense to talk about in the late 1990s. The district court condemned Microsoft actions in offering Internet Explorer free of charge, offering these access providers a bounty for each customer the access provider signs up for service using the Internet Explorer browser, developing the Internet Explorer access kit, and offering the Internet Explorer access kit for free. Now, the rare case of price predation aside, the antitrust laws do not condemn even a monopolist for offering its product at an attractive price. And we therefore have no warrant to condemn Microsoft for offering either Internet Explorer or the Internet Explorer uh, application kit free of charge or even at a negative price. Likewise, as we said above, a monopolist does not violate the Sherman Act simply by developing an attractive product. Therefore, Microsoft's development of the IEAK does not violate the Sherman Act. The Once we get to Apple, however, things change a little bit, right? In this case, plaintiffs allege that by closing to rivals a substantial percentage of the available opportunities for browser distribution, Microsoft managed to preserve its monopoly in the market for operating systems. Significantly, Microsoft's only explanation for its exclusive dealing is that it wants to keep developers focused upon its APIs, which is to say it wants to preserve its power in the operating system market. Accordingly, we affirm the district court's decision holding that Microsoft's exclusive contracts with IAPs are exclusionary devices in violation of Section 2 of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Then we get to the actual Apple agreement itself. Apple has agreed to bundle the most current version of Internet Explorer with the Mac operating system and to make Internet Explorer the default browser. Navigator is not installed on the computer hard drive during the default installation, which is the type of installation most users elect to employ. There's that default concept again. This exclusive deal between Microsoft and Apple has a substantial effect on the 
distribution of rival browsers. If a browser dis- developer ports its product to a second operating system, such as the Mac OS, it can continue to display a common set of APIs. Thus, usage share, not the underlying operating system, is the primary determinant of the platform challenge a browser may pose. Said another way, defaults count under the Sherman Antitrust Act Section 2 with this specific fact pattern. And one of the reasons for that is because, as the court finds, Microsoft offers no pro-competitive justification for this exclusive dealing arrangement with Apple. It makes only the irrelevant claim that the Internet Explorer for Mac Office deal is part of a multifaceted set of agreements between itself and Apple. That does not mean it has any pro-competitive justification. Accordingly, we hold that the exclusive deal with Apple is exclusionary in violation of Section 2 of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which, when we go back here and we talk about these things, means that the Department of Justice does have some kind of presidential power, precedent, from the Microsoft versus United States case to say that default rules and exclusionary contracts like the ones that Google enters into with Apple and with other browser sources could potentially run afoul of the Sherman Antitrust Act, most specifically if Google can't make some kind of pro-competitive justification argument for the behaviors that they are undertaking. Now, Google will probably do that in a manner that is better or more effective than what Microsoft put forth at the end of the 1990s or in the early 2000s because Microsoft was really acting on a novel case and didn't know exactly what the various judges and court of appeals would be looking for versus Google now not having that same problem for exactly the same reason that the Department of Justice identified. Google doesn't use certain terminology that got Microsoft in trouble way back when. Now we get to definitions of the market. We're going to try to skip through most of this because I do think that overall they probably do have monopoly power in the relevant markets, but there are certain arguments that they can make about that as well. The Department of Justice claims that general search services in the United States is a relevant antitrust market. Other search tools, platforms, and sources of information are not reasonable substitutes for general search services. Offline and online resources such as books, publisher websites, social media platforms, and specialized search providers such as Amazon Expedia or Yelp do not offer consumers the same breadth of information or convenience. Now, there's where I think one of the places that Google is really going to fight that if most people go to shop for something and they go to Amazon or they go to look for airfares and they go to Expedia or they go to look for restaurants and they go to Yelp, then it's not fair to just bifurcate general search services from these quote unquote specialized search providers in the manner that the Department of Justice is trying to do. That people every day use those as substitutes for specific searches in a fashion that means that they really should be considered the same market. Now, I tend to lean towards the Department of Justice here and say that Google and Bing and DuckDuckGo are providing a different service in a different market than these other places on the internet, but it's going to be a close question and it's going to be one that the judge or the Court of Appeals or maybe even the Supreme Court is going to have to look at pretty closely. You see references to the search engine U.S. market share from Google here. You see a lot of pictures. And then you see the Department of Justice's ultimate claim that Google's large and durable market share and the significant barriers to entry in general search services demonstrate Google's monopoly power in the United States. Again, I lean towards that being the case, that they do have monopoly power over the generalized search services market, but I could certainly see how somebody could argue that point. The Department of Justice then continues by establishing that search advertising in the United States is the relevant antitrust market. Other forms of advertising are not reasonably substitutable for search ads. For example, offline ads such as newspaper, billboard, TV, and radio ads cannot be targeted at a specific consumer based on the consumer's real-time self-disclosed interests. To some extent, true. Obviously, you get TV ads that are aimed at specific demographics that are watching this particular program and have demonstrated certain things about that program. Same with newspapers and billboards and really radio. You do target these things geographically and for other reasons, but there's no doubt that they can't be as micro-targeted as something online. The problem there is, of course, that you've got other places selling ads all over the place and you don't necessarily have this monopoly power resting solely in Google in a very similar kind of argumentative basis as with those specialized search engines concept, that you've got an Amazon out there, that you've got various other places that are also providing search services, which means they're also providing ad services. And if you're not a monopolist in general search services, because that's not a separate market, the Department of Justice, once again, has a problem establishing that you are a monopolist in advertising because that market is bigger than what you're claiming in this particular complaint. Similarly, they try to bifurcate search text advertising from other kinds of advertising, claim that Google has a monopoly in that for exactly the same reasons as they otherwise establish, and they bring up another interesting point. 
They say, in part for this reason, specialized search providers such as Amazon, Expedia, and eBay are among Google's largest customers for general search text ads, i.e. they buy general search text ads to drive consumers to their specialized search sites where they then sell specialized search ads to advertisers who want to reach those interested consumers at or near the point of purchase. You've got essentially multiple levels of marketing and advertising here that I want to buy shoes you put into Google and then Amazon has an ad that says, we've got shoes over here. You go over to Amazon, you say, I want to buy these shoes. And then somebody pays Amazon to get shown as these are the shoes that you want to buy. And that makes it so it does start to look a bit like separate markets, but whether or not that will ultimately win the day is going to be up to some judge and some economists somewhere establishing this from either the billion dollar corporation side, or of course the U S government side, Uh, you get some more kind of definitions of markets. And then you have the Google has monopoly power in search advertising and general search text advertising in the United States. Google's share of the U.S. search advertising market is over 70%. The Department of Justice claims that this actually understates Google's market power in search advertising because many search advertising competitors offer only specialized search ads, right? So they are trying to say, hey, this 70% number doesn't even take into account the fact that we can't actually separate those specialized search ads from this calculation. And so this is actually higher if we were only aiming it at the market that we're trying to establish in the other sections of this complaint, which is interesting, primarily because if they can't separate it, that does present another weakness in their overall definition of the market itself. And then you get where the rubber hits the road. This is where the court or where the Department of Justice actually has to find or claim that Google is acting anti-competitively with respect to the power that it holds. Google is a monopolist in the general search services, search advertising, and general search text advertising markets, period. That's what they tried to establish in the rest of the document. Google has unlawfully maintained its monopolies by implementing and enforcing a series of exclusionary agreements with distributors over at least the last decade. Particularly when taken together, Google's exclusionary agreements have denied rivals access to the most important distribution channels, which they allied here, but what they mean is default on various browsers and pieces of hardware. As a result... The large majority of searches are covered by Google's exclusionary contracts and own properties, leaving only a small fraction for competitors. By depriving them of scale, Google also hinders its rivals' ability to secure distribution going forward, insulating Google from competition. In sum, Google deprives rivals of the quality, reach, and financial position necessary to mount any meaningful competition to Google's long-standing monopolies. By foreclosing competition from rivals, Google harms consumers and advertisers. As I said earlier in the video, they're going to bring in that kind of middle period of advertisers that want to advertise to consumers that they have to pay too much to Google because it doesn't have competition, that the Department of Justice says at least. As one executive for a competing search product recognized in frustration last year, Google essentially has locked up all distribution with its Apple deal and restrictive Android licensing terms. In fact, they're paying for that privilege. Apple has not developed and does not offer its own general search engine. In exchange for this privileged access to Apple's massive consumer base, Google pays Apple billions of dollars in advertising revenue each year with public estimates ranging around eight to $12 billion. Now, one side note here that's worth noting is that Epic is currently fighting Apple for taking 30% of the amount of money that it receives for things like sales of V-Bucks in Fortnite, claiming that Apple isn't doing anything for those goods, to which the judge has responded uh, with certain respects to saying, well, you're getting access to their consumer base. Isn't that something of value? And Epic says, no, we should be allowed to do what we want. It's worth noting here that Google is getting practically nothing from Apple, at least as described in this Department of Justice complaint, and paying $10 billion for it solely because That means access to the folks that use an Apple iPhone. It's an interesting divergence of opinion as to what the value of the Apple hardware access is. And it's worth noting that if there isn't a reason to limit the access in this way, you might have more long tail effects than just Epic and just Microsoft and Sony and video games. If places like Google or Facebook or other big tech giants can break into ecosystems like Apple and Apple's hardware, what happens to this eight to $12 billion? What happens to the cost of phones? Will that actually improve the lives of consumers? That's something that the Department of Justice or Epic or anyone else that brings this claim actually has to establish. And there are a lot of question marks following that question. The revenues Google shares with Apple make up approximately 15 to 20% of Apple's worldwide net income. That is crazy. 
One fifth of Apple's worldwide net income comes from the fact that Google is the default search engine on their phones or tablets or Macintosh computers. That's crazy. But it also suggests that Google isn't a monopoly power because they wouldn't have to be paying that much money to have that level. And then in fact, Apple is closer to exerting that power because it has this big base of people that Google wants access to. It's a very interesting complaint because it suggests certain things about the power of these two companies that I don't think the Department of Justice really wants to suggest. Although it is possible to change the search default on Safari from Google to a competing general search engine, which is an important note, few people do, making Google the de facto exclusive general search engine. That is why Google pays Apple billions on a yearly basis for default status. Indeed, Google's documents recognize that Safari default is a significant revenue channel and that losing the deal would fundamentally harm Google's bottom line. In short, Google pays Apple billions to be the default search provider in part because Google knows the agreement increases the company's valuable scale. This simultaneously denies that scale to rivals. But if Google is actually getting that value out of the money spent for Apple, it's hard to see that as exclusionary. If scale is so important to this business model and it increases the company's valuable scale, is this not a pro-competitive justification right here? If those eyeballs are so important to actually functioning in this marketplace, then isn't Google paying this money doing the best thing possible for their business model? And that yes, it might deny that scale to rivals, but they have every pro-competitive justification for making their product more valuable and useful and better for consumers. You have a lot of this kind of side talk and side thoughts between Apple and Google and scale and all these various things in this document in a way that was designed to mirror Microsoft and Internet Explorer, but where that case diverges and maybe isn't so good of a precedent, the Department of Justice just plowed ahead and made their case anyway in a fashion that I think really could spin around back on them with Google and their counsel potentially making good counter arguments on a number of the things that I'm raising here in this video. Uh, in other words, because of the longtime deprivation of scale, no other search engine can offer Apple or any other partner the mix of quality brand recognition and economics that market dominant Google can. That's an interesting acknowledgement as well, right? That nobody can offer Google's quality or brand recognition or economics. That's fair. That means that Google's product is the best, at least as far as Apple is concerned, yes? And once that has been established, why does the Department of Justice stick its nose in? And that's going to be something that they're going to have to answer in what will undoubtedly be a years-long antitrust litigation. We then get another description of anti-forking agreements. Google's broad interpretation of the anti-forking agreements and its reluctance it creates among Android distributors to support alternative versions of Androids presents barriers to entry. We get more dis uh, discussion of pre-installation agreements. If a manufacturer wants even one of Google key apps and APIs, the device must be preloaded with a bundle of other Google apps. Google's pre-installation agreements effectuate a tie. This tie reinforces Google's monopolies. Note an important thing here. The Department of Justice is not actually bringing up this tying concept solely as illegal. This is one of the places that the Department of Justice got tripped up in with respect to Microsoft. When we look at the Microsoft case, and again, the highlights aren't popping up here, so I apologize for that. We see that the court wound up saying that in the land of software, it's unclear whether or not tying is actually a bad thing. It certainly shouldn't be per se illegal, we don't think because tying can benefit consumers, particularly when we're talking about software functionality and interoperability and the usefulness of your hardware or your operating system. Now they say that and they say, we note that our judgment regarding the comparative merits of the per se rule and the rule of reason is confined to the tying arrangement before us. Courts don't decide other things. We decide the, co the case or controversy in front of us where the tying product is software whose major purpose is to serve as a platform for third-party applications and the tied product is complementary software functionality. Our reading of the record suggests merely that integration of new functionality into platform software is a common practice and that wooden application of per se rules in this litigation may cast a cloud over platform innovation in the market for PCs, network computers, and information appliances, which you might recognize as smartphones here in the land of 2020, which is a long way of saying that the court found that we shouldn't just assume that tying things on a software functionality level together should be deemed illegal under the Sherman Antitrust Act. And because we don't just assume that, the Department of Justice is being very coy and very careful about saying, yeah, this is a tie. We don't like ties, but they don't say it's per se illegal. They really don't even claim that it's illegal at all. They just say it reinforces Google's monopolies. And then they just continue on with their complaint. 
Consumers desiring to use non-Google search access points thus suffer because they cannot save storage space on their devices by deleting unwanted Google apps because they are undeletable. The storage space concept is something that is potentially a problem, which is a, a hard case to make because the operating system itself is going to take up some space. And so does the Department of Justice have a complaint when Android is certain size and not a smaller size because consumers are somehow harmed? It's it's a tricky one. It's an interesting one, and I like it, but it's a tricky one to actually bring at this level of the case. Once the manufacturer adopts the necessary suite of Google apps, the search access points of those apps are preset to default to Google search engine. A senior executive at Google referred to changing Chrome's preset search default as totally off the table and insisted that if a manufacturer values their MADA, the agreement on this basis, they cannot modify Chrome settings. This is important to Google. They want it. Why? Because it's useful to them. That's why they're paying large amounts of money to have it. But is it anti-competitive? That remains the question. Most of Google's pre-installation agreements prevent rival assistants from being the preset default or using a home button. Discussing the proposal with colleagues, one Google employee noted, allowing a mode that does not have Google as the default search provider and completely changes the home screen would violate Google's terms and risk breach. They have these terms and these agreements for a reason. They don't want their hardware partners to be changing them. This is important to them. And undoubtedly, it does give them a leg up in certain aspects of the marketplace. And it does exclude other parties. But to what end? Is it anti-competitive? Is just setting a default when the other parties are fully welcome to add their own app store on a sideloading basis to change the default of their browser functionality on an Apple or wherever else you might find the Google search engine? Is that enough to really rise to the level here in 2020 of presenting a Sherman Antitrust Act case? Well, it looks like we're going to find out. Google has recognized for some time that its revenue sharing agreements with Android device manufacturers and carriers provide exclusivity for its general search service on those devices. You see it referenced here in a couple of slides that they found. Rev share deals provide exclusivity of search on devices. Of course, they don't provide. They backstop the exclusivity from the other agreements. But Google isn't being terribly careful with their PowerPoint presentations here. And the Department of Justice will find you and will put them into cases against you. And so, yep, that's on Google. And the Department of Justice has a nice little piece of evidence there. The size of Google's payments to Android distributors demonstrates the enormous value of default status and exclusivity provided by the agreements, while also, as we've discussed simultaneously, also indicating that Google can't not pay that money and continue its market position, which does suggest a certain weakness in the durability of their market power. If a carrier or manufacturer does not renew its revenue sharing agreement with Google, the distributor loses out on revenue share not only for new mobile devices, but also for the phones and tablets previously sold and in the hands of consumers. By not having some kind of long tail period here, the Department of Justice is saying that it locks in these other hardware manufacturers, other people that have entered into these contracts with Google, because when they turn them off, they don't get revenue even for the phones that they've already sold that have that default status. And while that's interesting, that doesn't necessarily make it exclusionary or anti-competitive either. Google agreements lock up browser distribution in exchange for being the preset default general search engine. Google shares up to 40% of the advertising revenue it generates from these search access points with Google's browser rivals. Today, Google has revenue sharing agreements with the most widely used browsers in the United States, such as Apple's Safari browser and Mozilla's Firefox browser. Microsoft's browsers are the only notable exception. In a competitive market, rivals could compete to be the preset default general search engine on a browser. The general search services market has not, however, been competitive for many years. Now this begs the question, what does the Department of Justice think a competitive market for the preset default looks like? Because as far as I'm concerned, a competitive market looks like these rivals, Mozilla's Firefox, Apple's Safari, Microsoft's Bing, Google's Google, would be competing on the basis of paying money or giving deals or giving other benefits to the various access point providers. And that's in fact what Google has been doing. They've just been doing it more fulsomely and bigger and better than their competitors. And yes, if that's competitive market, it certainly looks like one to me from the outside. So what does the Department of Justice think this looks like? And I'm open to being wrong on that. They think it looks like something else. Perhaps they think that Apple and the various other access point providers shouldn't be allowed to sell defaults. But I think that's also unlikely because at some level, there's always a default. Even if you had a menu that came up when you first installed your iPhone and it just had a list of browsers. Somebody's going to be on top. Somebody's going to be in the top left corner. Somebody is going to be where the cursor is already hovering. And that in and of itself is going to be worth some amount of money, money that Mozilla or Google or Microsoft would be willing to pay for. 
And then is the concept from the Department of Justice that nobody should be allowed to realize that money, even though they've created a piece of hardware that is apparently valuable to someone else, that that someone else wants to pay them for it, that that act in and of itself is anti-competitive when it seems like it's actually really competitive. It's unclear at a baseline fundamental level what the Department of Justice would see the world look like. And I really do think at a practical and logistical conceptual level, that's one of the issues that people are likely to have with this entire case against Google. We scroll a little further, they repeat themselves a lot, and then we get to the claims about anti-competitive effects. They say that Google doing this substantially forecloses competition in general search services. They exclude general search service rivals from effective distribution channels, that there is no effective distribution channel but for default. They impede other potential distribution paths. They increase barriers to entry, they stunt innovation, and they insulate Google from competitive pressure. Google can reduce the quality of the services it provides to advertisers, including by restricting the information it offers to advertisers about their marketing campaigns. And undoubtedly, many people have complaints about what information Google gives you. And Google says, fine, go elsewhere. And they say, we can't. And maybe that's a better argument than overall just the search engine default concept but they need it. The Department of Justice needs to establish that monopoly power in the overall search engine to arrive at monopoly power in the advertising portion of that search engine, because otherwise, if they don't establish that, it's very difficult to establish the monopoly power in the sub portion of a place where you can't establish that Google otherwise has monopoly power. Absent Google's exclusionary agreements and other conduct, dynamic competition for general search services would lead to higher quality search, increased consumer choice, and a more beneficial user experience. Now, they don't have to at this point. This is just a complaint. But this is the kind of sentence that they're going to have to show. They're going to have to show their work to a judge. They're going to have to get economists to actually give evidence on this. Google is going to have counter economists talking about how what they have provided with the scale that the Department of Justice says is so important, provides consumers their best, best product that Google can offer. And that's going to be a fight. And it's not one that I can answer for you right now, but I would strongly suspect that Google has quite a bit of backing from a lot of economists and a lot of folks that look at these network effects and look at what Google is doing as providing the maximally beneficial user experience, at least in the absence of some really significant government action, which we will see is what the government winds up asking for. Now, in terms of the violations alleged, this just repeats one last time what we've talked about already. Google has willfully maintained and abused its monopoly power in general search services through anti-competitive and exclusionary distribution agreements that lock up the preset default positions and then also require pre-installation and tie Google search access points to the availability of Google Play and Google APIs. And the anti-competitive effects of these agreements outweigh any pro-competitive benefits in this market, trying to get ahead of the actual rule of reason analysis, although they don't actually address any of what the pro-competitive benefits of the market might be, including some of the things that they've admitted, like the importance of scale and the quality that Google can provide. Google has willfully maintained and abused its monopoly power in search advertising through the same thing. Google has willfully maintained and abused its monopoly power in general search text advertising through the same thing. And so we would ask judge that you decree that they have acted unlawfully. B, that you enter structural relief as needed to cure any anti-competitive harm. Break them up if you have to, judge. We're okay with it. Quite the strong position for the Department of Justice to take. Enjoin Google from continuing to engage in the practices that we have described. Enter any other preliminary or permanent relief necessary and appropriate in your good judgment. Enter anything else that you find just and proper and award us all with the amount of costs incurred. Now, awarding costs is important, right? The Department of Justice brings this case against Google for a number of reasons, probably for politics purposes, definitely, but also because if they can get a penalty or a fee or a settlement amount out of Google, that's going to fund some offices around the country. That's going to fund the Department of Justice. It's going to fund various state AGs. And so the people that wanted to be a part of this know that if this is a winner at the end of the day, they're going to make some money from Google on this, regardless of what else happens. And so you do have that profit motive as well. But if you take nothing else from this deep dive into this particular document, the main thing to take away is that the entire premise of the Department of Justice's case is that people, consumers, are so unwilling to change the default search engine on their phones or tablets or PCs or through any other place that they can access a browser that the failure of consumers to change the default amounts to exclusion of competition by Google. 
and that Google is a monopoly purveyor of search services, even though they have to pay billions of dollars out to these various access points, and that in the absence of true competition, consumers are harmed by all of this activity. Now, as you probably rightly suspect, Google did not take well to the filing of this lawsuit yesterday. They titled a blog post, a deeply flawed lawsuit that would do nothing to help consumers. And we're not going to go over this in detail. We are, of course, going to link this in the description of this video. But they said today's lawsuit by the Department of Justice is deeply flawed. To the contrary, it would artificially prop up lower quality search alternatives, raise phone prices, and make it harder for people to get the search services that they want to use. Apple features Google search in its Safari browser because they say Google is the best. This agreement, this arrangement, by the way, is not exclusive. Our competitors Bing and Yahoo paid a prominently feature and other rival services also appear. They highlight that Yahoo and Bing are in these various favorites tabs that you can see here. They aren't the actual default search if you just go and search under something in Safari, which is really what the Department of Justice claim is aimed at, but they are featured in various places on the iPhone 11 and MacBook Pro per this blog post. Changing your search engine in Safari is easy. On desktop, one click and you're presented with a range of options. You also see that Microsoft does the very same thing by preloading Bing onto Windows devices. That Android can have itself be changed with one click. They even have a helpful GIF here that shows, hey, look, we can just put Bing on here and we can change it, no problem. Not any issue to changing the settings on an Android. And the bigger point that the lawsuit misses, according to Google, as we said when we looked at the case, is that people don't use Google because they have to. They use it because they choose to. Now, the counter argument there is, okay, let's say that's true, Google. Why are you paying $10 billion to Apple, right? If people choose to use you, why is that money necessary? And the answer might well be that default is important. And if we don't pay that money in a real competitive market that exists today, as Google might argue, then Microsoft will pay that money and they will put Bing and Yahoo in as the default. And that will cost us more than $10 billion because certain people really do just like whatever's presented in front of them. But that doesn't make our behavior exclusionary because there will always be a default. Somebody will always be in that default position. And so because somebody will always be in that default position, somebody will always be, as they describe it, eye level in the aisle at the grocery store then somebody is going to pay money to get that position and it might as well be us. And the Department of Justice doesn't, I don't think, have a really good argument in response to that claim. Somebody is going to be default. And is the problem that Google is too big to be default? Maybe, but that is a tough claim for the Department of Justice to make. And it's going to be a tough claim to see proceed probably for a multi-year long antitrust case. You see Google then going forth with more animations about how easy it is to change your browser. And then they also point out some of the other things that we said. When searching to buy something, 60% of Americans start on Amazon. And American antitrust law is designed to promote innovation and help consumers not tilt the playing field in favor of particular competitors or make it harder for people to get the services they want. We are confident that a court will conclude that this suit doesn't square with either the facts or the law. In the meantime, we remain absolutely focused on delivering the free services that help Americans every day. So at the end of all this, you've got my thoughts. I'm very curious to hear what yours are. Please leave comments to this video. I think certainly Google and Facebook and Twitter and Twitch and all these other tech companies have really hurt their own goodwill with some of the behaviors that they have taken, some of the ways that they have operated, particularly in this election season. And so I do think there is a big kind of growth of outrage about how they have behaved and the control they have over people's data. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I don't think this case is a very strong one unless a court in 2020 finds that those decisions made by the Court of Appeals and the D.C. Circuit Courts and everything else on Microsoft versus the United States with respect to Internet Explorer really should control what this brand new, as far as the law is concerned, model actually is. This has been Virtual Legality for today. I hope you enjoyed this. Sorry, it went a little bit long here, but it always does when we take a deep dive into a lawsuit as we often do here in this space. If you like this, please like, subscribe, share, tell people that we are here having these conversations on YouTube and elsewhere on the internet. You can catch this in a podcast form in places like Spotify and I think Google uh, and, and elsewhere. So please do check it out there as well. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of virtual legality.
Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.